So as you settle into your seat, into this space and gently close your eyes. At first with our eyes closed we often continue to see the images of people's faces or maybe the buttons on your computer screen. So just recognising that those images, those visions are being seen now with your mind. The eye sense of door has been closed. And so you've pulled over a blanket on your eyes. You may notice sounds in your environment. You can hear the sirens going up the road. And the neighbours did indeed start to talk. So I just recognise the impressions in the mind. Any response, reactivity. See if I can just relax and allow it to be. Shifting from the active doer to the more passive knower or watcher. Just allowing feelings, thoughts, moods to arise, to be felt. And if they wish to pass away, Resting in the silence when all the sirens stop and the neighbours become quiet. Allowing the silence to become a resting place for the mind. And we'll start with a simple body scan. Perhaps start from the top of the head. Just tuning in to any sensations that you experience at the top of the head. awareness to be a friendly presence infusing your awareness with kindness and warmth as you spread that kind awareness all across the top of the head the scalp the ears, forehead, noticing any places that there may be tension, perhaps in the brow, and also noticing any space. in the eye cavity, the 
space in the jaw, allowing your body to really occupy the space. Moving down into the neck, the shoulders, really exploring any sensations there. Letting your body know it's in the friendly presence of the mind. And this kindness, friendship and warmth allows the body to relax. Taking away the energy from doing Driving, trying to fix things up and instead just letting the energy flow into the knowing part of the mind infusing that knowing with kindness and warmth as though bathing your body in the golden light of the sun Moving down your arms, every little piece of your arms. Noticing any sensations there, some may be more strong or noticeable than others. Some may be very subtle and require a subtle attunement of awareness. If you don't feel very much, that's fine. Just allow the mind to rest. In the arms, the wrists, the hands. Assuring your body that it's in a friendly presence. It's not seeking to control, but just to let be. Relax. Once again, in your own time, you can moving up to the neck area, perhaps the throat. And just letting that awareness slowly suffuse the entire front of the body, the chest. Between each collarbone. Swirling around the ribs, the belly, 
and all those organs inside the trunk. Noticing any sensations. And noticing if it feels good to be very close to those sensations. Really moving in toward them. Or whether you want to keep your mindfulness a little bit more peripheral. Giving those sensations space. Being very patient with your mind. Just resting the awareness wherever it flows. And giving mindfulness time to increase in strength and energize the mind. Exploring the sides of the body, the back. You may wish to stay on the surface, the skin. Perhaps noticing the spine, the spinal cord. Or you may not start noticing sensations inside. Allow it to be very natural, making no demands on the mind. Continuing to offer this friendly presence to the legs, the hips, the buttocks, perhaps some of the sensations are stronger, where there's more weight flowing into the ground. See if you can enjoy this process like an exploration of discovery. Taking the opportunity to really care for 
every part of your body, every sensation that manifests there. And if you find any pain that's caused by an unskillful sitting posture, then don't force yourself to sit through the pain. But very gently, calmly and kindly, just simply adjust your knee or limb. Sometimes one moment of adjustment releases more energy later on. So the energy is not flowing into fighting but into kindness and into care. Softening into any tight, maybe piercing, throbbing sensations. Seeing if you can just give them a little more space. Maybe physical space, maybe mental space. By widening the focus of your awareness. So really being playful, intuitive, curious. But always suffusing the mindfulness with care. You might even pick up the effect of kindness on your experience, how the sensations change. Experiencing your ankles, feet, top of the foot, each and every toe. Maybe sensations of tingling, pulsing, warmth or cold. Noticing the changing nature of everything that arises. All in a flux, all in a flow. Keep on just allowing this awareness infused with friendliness and warmth to flow through your body. And I'll be quiet for another five to ten minutes before we end the meditation.
as we come close to the end of the meditation, I'd like to invite you to just see if you can pick up on any subtle, pleasant, agreeable sensations, Sukha Vedana in the body or in the mind. Not looking for something special, but just gently tuning in to even the slightest sense of peace, ease or relaxation. Perhaps tingling in the palms of the hands. And just see if your mind can be very spacious and gently rest in the pleasant, soothing nature of stillness and peace. Centered and easily satisfied with little. And you'll find that whatever you value, wherever you find contentment, Happiness will increase. Before we open our eyes, you may wish to just gently scan through the body again as though you're smiling at your body from inside, assuring it of your loving, friendly presence, thanking your body for cooperating with you for this half an hour. thanking yourself for offering yourself this gift of space, of silence and of peace. use a bell because sometimes it can sound a little bit harsh at the end of a meditation so just opening your eyes whenever you wish you don't have to open your eyes if you just want to stay connected within yourself you can listen to a Dhamma talk actually through through the felt sense in an embodied way and sometimes I find it can be more um, enriching as though the words are speaking to me from within. But it's up to you. So please uh, surface when you wish. And I'll share a few reflections about energising the mind. And uh, I guess I wanted to make a link between this session and last week's session, uh, which was about trusting our inner refuge. And it was really... I talk about the first indriya. The Buddha talked about five um, indriyas or balas, which are like powers of the mind. And the first one is sadha, which literally, often translated as confidence, but I used the word trust last week. And uh, the second of these five indriyas is virya, which means energy. And then the next one is mindfulness, sati. The third one is samadhi, calm or stillness. 
I always avoid the word concentration because that's simply not how stillness comes about. And then the last one is wisdom. And often when the Buddha categorizes things in these lists or in these groups, they're actually a causal sequence. And if you look closely at this one, it becomes quite clear um, why that is. And so the sadha, the confidence, is like the foundation for the other indriyas to arise. And the stronger that foundation, the stronger the subsequent factors will be. Of course, it's not necessarily linear. They all feed into the other. But you do need a certain amount of trust, of confidence, enough at least to give the path a try. So one of the reasons I also wanted to talk about energizing the mind is because so many of us are struggling now with tiredness and you know with exhaustion, even though our lives are so different, perhaps because our lives are so different from how they've been in previous years. And you know, just hearing the things that are happening in the news, now we have to I don't know if you're reading the news, but there's all the stuff around Brexit happening again and you know, the pandemic and what's going to happen over Christmas and just, you know, thinking of these long winter days and I think a lot of us have experienced a, a kind of tiredness and that can lead into, um, into depression. Depression's often a low energy state. You know, I'm talking more about the um, intermittent depression or fairly, I don't know if you can call any depression mild, but of course there's some depression which is... Um, very associated with a chemical change in, in the brain and at those times you know it might be necessary to seek medical advice and to you know take medications if we need to but often the kind of depression that comes and goes I've noticed in my own life can come from simply having a very tired exhausted mind and uh, it's interesting the way that the mind works because the body tends to get stronger and more powerful and more energised by exercising or by you know, being busy with it, by using it a lot. But the mind is the opposite and actually the more we use the mind, the more in input we have in our minds, the more information that we kind of obsessively try to gobble down sometimes, the tireder the mind becomes. So the mind is actually energised in a very different way. It's energised by keeping it still. So this is sometimes counterintuitive, especially because when we start to meditate, um, keeping the mind still doesn't always lead to a great rush of energy. It can actually lead into some drowsiness and some weariness, what the Buddha calls sloth and torpor. But I've noticed that if I just stay with that sloth and torpor, that sort of drowsiness, or somebody earlier on said a sort of flat feeling in the body and mind. After a while, it's almost as though the lights of the mind start to... Uh, it's like when you put a light on, a saver lamp, you know, and it looks really dim. The bulb is like hopeless. I had a light like that downstairs, and for the first month or so living here, I used to just turn it off again and go into another room because I didn't realise it was a saver lamp, a uh, light bulb. <laughs> I was too impatient to, to allow it to brighten up. And that's very similar to the mind, you know. Sometimes we start to move our mind, for example, through the body and everything's very vague. We don't feel very much at all. Um, I know that there are people who don't feel their body at all. You know, they really can't locate their limbs. And sometimes that's because their mind is just so gross. It's been so active and, you know, bombarded with very um, impactful things. And so when we first come into contact with the body, we tend to feel... The stronger sensations, the more um, disturbing, unpleasant sensations. We have that sort of negativity bias as well, that our mind will just tend to incline to whatever it thinks is a problem or a threat. But after a while, when we very gently, very patiently you know, move our mind through the different bodily parts, the different sensations, and stay, linger in various areas, then it's like the lights start to turn up in the mind and we start to see more. We start to see the way things arise. So I did want to make a link between the confidence and the energy. Um, and I wanted to start by just recapping a little bit on um, a definition that I used last week for trust. And this was actually a definition that I found in some sort of online dictionary and I added a bit to it. Um, but I really loved it and this was 
that trust is a reliance or resting of the mind on something or someone good or honourable or a reliance or resting of the mind on qualities like honesty, integrity, truth, kindness and love. You can add whatever qualities you want to there, loyalty, um, forgiveness, you know, resilience. It's a resting of the mind on those beautiful, ennobling qualities of the heart. And I think that's so lovely because that also links into why this would then lead to energy because we're giving the mind a rest. You know, it becomes a refuge for the mind, for the heart. And uh, I like another uh, definition that Bhikkhu Bodhi gives. He's a very famous and wonderful um, Pali scholar who's translated all the Pali texts. He's also an engaged Buddhist who does a lot of climate activism and he's very supportive of full ordination for nuns. So he's a really wonderful and very humble person and um, so sometimes I read his articles and his definition of confidence from a Buddhist point of view was um, a willingness to take on trust or remain open to possibilities that are beyond our ability to verify through personal experience. I think I got that more or less right. So to remain open or take on trust, things that we've yet to verify through experience. And I really like that as well because sometimes, you know, we can, I suppose we can go different ways. We can say, well, that doesn't make sense to me, therefore it, it can't be true. You know, I can't accept that. And then we don't even try to find out. The other, of course, is to just accept things blindly and to say, well, if the Buddha said so, if these teachers say so, that must be right. But the Buddha never asked for blind faith or acceptance, and he actually warned us against it. He said, you know, when you know for yourself that these things are good and beneficial and lead to the happiness for yourself and others, then accept them as the Dhamma. And until then, don't just do nothing but find out. So I love this idea of, um, you know, enough confidence to at least start taking steps but not enough to feel that you know until you've actually verified things for yourself. So I kind of think of confidence as being of various stages, like at first it's like an inspired confidence. You feel really inspired, you know, by people that you've met who've been practicing or who do really wonderful things in the world. If you're into climate activism, you know, you're inspired by the leaders of that movement or by other people that you collaborate with. You know, maybe you want to start living a vegan lifestyle and you're inspired by the ethics, by the, you know, the um, potential for non-harm through that path. Whatever it is, we need some kind of inspiration. And of course, classically, you know, the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha are what Buddhists take refuge in. And not with people, not the Buddha as a person. The Buddha, you know, attained Parinibbana a very long time ago. And even with Sangha, like especially our present day teachers or people we you know, have confidence in that have realised something further along the path than we have, we're not taking refuge in them as a person, we're taking refuge in the capacity for the human heart to be free. Yeah? So we're actually taking refuge in the possibility for awakening and sometimes seeing that embodied in another person brings it to life. I know how that's helped me in my path and uh, it continues to be an enormous source of energy. You know, because when we're inspired, we really develop a lot of uplift in the heart. We have a sense of reverence, you know, a sense of something being sacred, not in a Christian way, but something that we can hold up, you know, as, a, as something to inspire our life, something to align our lives to. And reverence and trust is something akin to love, you know, real love. The love of these beautiful qualities, transformative qualities that we all have inside. And so this is one way that, you know, confidence can really energise the mind by giving us that inspiration. And that inspiration then translates into how we live our life. So we're inspired by the goodness we see in others and we want to emulate that behaviour or take that behaviour as an example, you know, to, um, to, we'll all manifest 
us our own qualities in different ways, but we can take inspiration and, and allow that to help us find our way. You know, you can also do that by seeing people who don't live ethical lives, you know, and seeing the harm that causes. And I've often, you know, learned from people that I feel maybe have made mistakes, or myself, right, when I make mistakes. And I think, okay, this is how I don't want to be. This is the pathway that I don't want to follow because it doesn't lead to freedom and it does lead to harm. So the beautiful thing is the more we practice virtue, the more happiness and joy arises because it feels good to do good and to see the effects of that goodness in the world, you know. When we're kind to others, especially when they didn't expect it or when we could have so easily been cruel, and you see that person's face light up or their body relax, and you see that you bring them some hope. And that, you know, gives them more joy and that inspires you to do even more good. I read this really nice story on... Um, it's a, a Facebook group, but it's one that I really like, called The Kindness Pandemic. And uh, there's always lots of really beautiful stories in there. Sometimes a little bit material, because people are sort of paying for things for total strangers and that sort of stuff. But this particular one really touched me, because um, one of the main reasons it touched me was because the woman who wrote the story was actually in a really bad mood and had had a really difficult day some sort of uh, storm had happened and I think a, a tree had fallen over the road so she was late and she had all these business appointments and a contract that didn't work out and uh, she went to this restaurant to have lunch and when she went there she saw this uh, very frail elderly man and his wife uh, with their family and they wanted to have a meal and there were no seats in the restaurant but then she saw that there was another man with his two daughters and when they saw this elderly couple come in, they basically um, gave up their seat for them and sat somewhere else so that this family could sit down. And this woman who observed this made a decision at that moment that she didn't want to project her misery, she didn't want to project that negativity outward, she wanted to turn it around. And she felt genuinely touched by the people's kindness in changing their seat. So she went to the, um, what do you call it, cashier, and she paid for their breakfast anonymously. So later on, of course, you know, they went to pay and they found that they, you know, that it was already paid for. Um, and then the person that she paid the meal for thought it must be her. So he came to her and said, thank you. And she went bright red and said, oh, no, you know, it wasn't. She tried to pretend it wasn't her. <laughs> and, uh, and then they left the restaurant and... Um, and then she found out when she went to pay that the uh, restaurant had paid for her meal. <laughs> but it didn't end there because what happened then was that this um, man and his two daughters, who she paid for, went to the shops and bought her a gift and gave her this gift which cost twice as much as the meal. And in there it said, buy something nice for yourself and it was enough to get some like cosy pyjamas. So she did that and then... Um, the old man and his family <laughs> started to ask the restaurant, like, what's all, the, what's all this fuss, you know, what's going on? And then the restaurant uh, owner said, oh, it's because this person moved and they paid for their meal and la la la. And then the old man and his wife were so overcome and so overjoyed and he said that it was actually his 90th birthday and the family had come over just for that. And that day his wife had been suffering with her chronic um, condition, chronic pain. And of course, you can imagine how happy that made them. <laughs> and this lady who wrote the post said she was just in floods of tears several times throughout this story. Every time the kind acts were reciprocated. And it was as if, you know, they were just increasing the happiness and the kindness through this incredible feedback loop. And uh, this is very similar to what can start to happen in meditation when we start to really get into the path, you know, and not just in meditation, but in daily life, through acting with kindness and going that extra way, you know, especially when we don't feel like it, especially when we're hurting ourselves. And it's, you know, this frees up so much energy for the mind, and that's a really wholesome kind of joy. The Buddha called it Anavajasukha, which means blameless bliss. 
because you have freedom from remorse. You have this sense, yes, I did good. I could have gone the negative way, but I chose a different pathway in my mind. And when you have joy and energy arising in the mind, that increases mindfulness, yeah? That feeds into mindfulness. A flat mind, a dull mind, a mind clouded with doubt is a mind that can't really stay with its object. It can't really stay long enough to become aware, to become awake, for the lights to shine up in the mind, right? So when we have this joy and energy, the mindfulness is empowered. And this is beautiful because then we can stop ourselves, you know, in our lives before we do something that might cause harm. You know, how many times in life do we almost say something that could have really hurt somebody? Or, I did it today, I wrote an email where I was a little bit fed up with, <laughs> with the communication in one of my teams. I have to manage many teams and I have no management experience at all. Um, so I wrote an email sort of saying, this isn't really good enough. <laughs> and why weren't people following each other up on this? You know, something should have been done about this three years ago. And uh, I knew I did that because I was getting frazzled. I wasn't, you know, taking that deep breath and just slowing down. So very quickly I realised that was uh, uh, not very skillful. So since then I've sent at least two emails apologising. <laughs> I was kind of hoping they'd write back and say, oh, don't worry about it, but not yet. <laughs> so that's also the repercussions, you know, of making a rash decision to press send. <laughs> and this is what we do when we're tired, isn't it? You know, this is the problem with an unenergized mind. So obviously another advantage of um, confidence in the mind is that it overcomes this doubt, this crippling doubt or sceptical doubt, which, which clouds the mind. And this is what the Buddha called one of the five hindrances, hindrance number three. Um, and the antidote to that hindrance, of course, is the confidence. So, and the hindrances are a problem for the mind because they actually prevent us seeing clearly. The Buddha said that they are obscurations of the mind. The word in Pali is nivarana, not nibbana, <laughs> but nivarana. And it means like a curtain or a, um, a kind of sheath over the mind. Yeah? So it obscures the object completely, but it could also distort what we see. Yeah? So we don't see it clearly. If you imagine, say, like chiffon or something, which is, I don't know, and the light's shining on it, things are kind of bent. Or if you look through a glass, for example, things, reflections are not clear. So what we see is not really what's there, you know, that often happens with people, <laughs> right, you know a certain person's qualities that annoy you and um, they happen to trigger something in you and that's in your mind when you go to meet them, so the first sign of, of that trait or even something that's not that trait but looks like that trait will immediately trigger a certain response, you know, because we're seeing only one part of the picture, we're not seeing the thing clearly, and sometimes, as I say, we make errors and we get it all wrong. We know that people do that to us as well. But yeah, the last thing, <coughs> the way that um, confidence can help energise the mind is again related to that definition that trust is like a resting place for the mind. Because when we can start to trust in our own goodness, we can start to trust in the Dhamma and in the path. Yeah, we can trust that Suffering has a cause, and that cause can actually be eradicated, or at least, you know, um, eroded, let's say, or, or modified. Um, then we start to feel like, yes, this is a good path to walk on, this can lead to peace. Yeah? Or we start to understand that, you know, our actions have effects, and the quality of our intention determines whether those effects will lead to happiness. For ourselves and others, or or not, you know, if we act with a pure mind, if we act with a mind of kindness and care, if we act with a, a mind of letting go rather than wanting to control or possess, um, if we act with a gen with gentleness rather than cruelty, then we can have confidence that that will produce wholesome results that will, in, you know, cause happiness for ourselves 
and hopefully for others to arise. Certainly we're not contributing to the suffering in the world. Yeah? So we can start to have confidence in this and confidence that, you know, the Buddha taught a path to freedom and that the results that we experience so far are, are promising. Even if we don't feel we've walked very far, even just sitting for half an hour sometimes can, you know, free up some more space, some more energy for the mind simply because you've allowed your mind to rest. And I said this to my mom today, actually, and she said, that's the one that speaks to me, you know, resting your mind, being able to let go, being able to just put down worry for a while. And it's so hard to do that, isn't it? It can be so hard. I put a little um, question up on Facebook, because I have to go on Facebook, really, for the project. I'm trying to start a, a monastery for nuns over here. Um, so I put up my talks and, you know, try to sort of keep people engaged in the long process that it takes for things to come together. I try and keep the enthusiasm going. But uh, yesterday I put up a little post and it said something like, um, reflection or invitation to reflect. How can I best care for this moment? That was the first question. And the second one was, um, what does my body, heart and mind most need right now? And I wanted to just read out a few of the responses because I thought it was interesting that um, many of the answers were around rest and letting go. Yeah. So even asking these questions, people were saying, thank you so much, you've given me a moment to pause, because by asking those questions... Um, you give people the opportunity to tune in to how they are. So people answer the question, how can I best care for this moment? One of them said, being mindful of thoughts and how they affect my emotions. One person said, I can best care for this moment by being more fully present to it. Which I thought was lovely because so often we just dismiss this moment in the hope of something better later on. Right? Another person said, um, I can best for, care for this moment by not following a habitual response. So that links into what I said about, you know, as mindfulness arises, we can actually catch ourselves, right? We can see that, oh, I have a choice. I can choose to respond this way or another way, or maybe abstain from responding at all. And then when I asked about what does my body, heart, mind need most right now, people basically said rest, quiet, absolute kindness, to slow down. And one person kind of uh, echoed what I most needed too. They said, um, what I most need right now is to do one thing at a time, mindfully and with great precision with a slow and steady heartbeat and not just a rushing, frantic, stressed one. <laughs> and at that moment I was sort of in the middle of reading that, getting a cup of tea, making sure the cup of tea didn't land on my pen on the table and kind of <laughs> sitting down and I thought, oh yeah, that's true. I could slow down the heartbeat a little bit and just take a pause. So it can be counterintuitive, this energy thing, because in, as I say, in physical energy and even mental energy, sometimes we think that if we stimulate ourselves, we'll get more energy in the mind. You know, say you, you might feel too tired to sit down and meditate, but you're not too tired to watch a kind of a kind of crazy stimulating movie on Netflix or <laughs> thinking that that, you know, you have energy for that and even maybe that will energise the mind. But the thing is, that's borrowed energy because you put it in your brain but it actually um, exhausts you more in the longer run. And this is very clear when you meditate. Um, there was a retreat I did where I really followed the instructions for once. And Ajahn Brahm's instructions are often to actually do nothing at all, right? And I was like, you can't just do nothing. I mean, if I just sit there, then, I mean, I'll go to sleep or the mind will go everywhere, right? How can I just sit there and do nothing? But for once, I had confidence in my mind and I thought, well, it's week six of my retreat and I'm not getting that still. 
so maybe I'll just give it a go. So I had the confidence to trust my teacher, trust in the process, and I sat down and let my mind do absolutely nothing at all. So I guess my mindfulness was more poised to notice when this interferer would crop up and start trying to control. You know, whenever the voice came up, I should be with my breath, or, oh, I just think I'll start scanning. It's like, no, you just stay. You stay in the moment. <laughs> you just do nothing. And I did go through several days of drowsiness and sort of mm, that sort of, what's the word? Like, mm, obscure? Is that, no. Opaque? I'm not sure. Kind of cloudy mind. Um, but then it was like magic. After my mind had really, it was as though the brain was like finally being allowed to turn off. Something like that. And after about two or three days when it had enough, it just started to come back. And it came back in a very balanced way. Like it wasn't the kind of energy that had been created through will or through effort. Or even through trying to be aware, you know. It was just an energy that started to build and build and build in my mind the more I kept it still. And this was really amazing. It was something like I said at the end of last week about how, you know, we put drops in our jar or we put like, we take steps on the path and the reservoirs within ourselves start to fill. And it felt like that, this sort of inner reservoir of stillness and energy was just growing and growing and growing. And for many days, maybe even a couple of weeks, I had this very poised mindfulness and not hardly a single thought. And I was like, oh, so this is how you stop thinking. You, It actually just happens, eventually, by keeping still. <laughs> and I had not a single thought. And a lot of bliss, a lot of joy, which was definitely a result of that stillness because the energy wasn't flowing out. But the reason I knew in retrospect that how much thoughts drain the mind is because when the thoughts started to come back again after after quite a while, as soon as they started to come back again, I needed an extra hour's sleep in the day, even though I was still on retreat. Right? Even just having that mental activity, because I hadn't had it really hardly any, it was very obvious how that affects the mind, it was very obvious that that actually drains energy, even though sometimes I'm engaged and I'm enjoying my thoughts, <laughs> right? So these are subtle things, but it, it was very insightful for me. And uh, physically, I can really feel that too. Like someone asked in the beginning, how was my three-month retreat? I did a three-month um, solitary retreat here in Oxford over the summer, normally it would be my monastic rains retreat, which all monastics do, but I couldn't get into Perth this year to be in the rain, <laughs> Australian winter time, so it was a British summertime retreat, and uh, it was a retreat with a lot of contentment for me, mainly because of good teachings, and my teacher told me, he said, make contentment the goal. Not jhanas and enlightenment or any, make contentment the goal. And I took that to heart because I realised that if I make anything else my goal, I'm going to be striving, I'm going to be, you know, possibly failing. Um, it's not going to be a retreat. It's basically going to be business again, right? I do this to get this result. So by making contentment my goal, I did become still and energised and fairly happy and balanced for those three months. And I remember trying to come out of the retreat carefully because three months is a long time and you think that you're functioning at a normal speed, but you're not really. Um, <laughs> I realised that one day when I went down Cowley Road. For anyone who lives in Oxford, I walked down Cowley Road and it was just a crazy day. It was sort of 30, 35 degrees and people were drunk and people were on the streets and it was sad really. There was someone so drunk that they literally like did a twist around a lamppost that they literally spiralled around it and slumped onto the floor and right next to him there was a homeless woman who made some sort of comment like nice move but she obviously was also kind of in a really bad way and the whole thing was just wow you know right outside this little sanctuary of peace there's another world going on so that was interesting 
And actually, I thought it was quite valuable because sometimes monastics can be too far removed from the world, like in a bubble, and I don't think that's healthy. But anyway, the point of that story is that I realised, yeah, that I should come out of my retreat um, gently. And so the first day that I started to engage, I had an hour's phone conversation with my sister. And then I had maybe an hour of emails. And the next day morning, I missed my first hour of meditation because I needed an hour's extra sleep. (laughs) Uh, Maybe I'm just super sensitive, but it's really interesting and it's just to illustrate how the mind gains energy from giving it rest. You know, so if you are going through dullness, don't worry, the lights will start to turn up in the mind. As long as, this is the other part of the simile, like that's the light simile, but if you think of the reservoir simile, so the reservoir fills with water, this is with your awareness, your joy, your mindfulness, it's filling up, it's filling up. And it continues to fill as long as you put all the attention into the knowing, not into the doing, yeah? As long as the mind doesn't start to interfere. Come on, mind, back to the breath. Come on, stop thinking. Don't do that. Just put the awareness into the knowing of what's happening. So if you do that, the energy flows into the knower and the reservoir fills. The only problem is if there's a leak in the dam (laughs) or a crack, you know, in the bricks. And that crack is the hindrances, the five hindrances. So again, how does confidence energize the mind? Because it overcomes doubt, which is one of those five hindrances. Yeah. So by having confidence in the process, by trusting the process, you know, by having patience, because confidence and trust gives us patience to just stay with what's arising. Yeah to just give things time to work themselves out. By having that confidence and then the energy that arises, we start to plug up those leaks. You know, the confidence also can help us overcome other hindrances. Contentment also helps us overcome a lot of the hindrances. The hindrances of um, desire, wanting results more quickly, yeah, or wanting to get to a more interesting state of mind, more bliss, you know, is this the jhana, is this not the jhana, this is craving, sometimes, <laughs> or aversion, not wanting to stay with what we've got, feeling it's not good enough, feeling we're not good enough, yeah, so these are the leaks, but if we can, you know, notice this and, and just keep on developing that contentment, that trust, that confidence, then the energy and the mindfulness builds and builds in the mind and can lead us into states of stillness. Yeah, so from again for those five uh, strengths of the mind, the five indriyas or the five balas, it's confidence that leads to energy, that leads to mindfulness, and then stillness. Yeah, as the mindfulness increases, the mind becomes still, and as the stillness increases, the mindfulness becomes empowered, and then lastly, that leads to wisdom because when the mind is still and free from hindrances, we do have a chance to see things as they are. And just to end this talk, because I want to give some time for Q&A, I wanted to just uh, go back to the story I told last week about this um, enlightened nun in the time of the Buddha, the Venerable Patachara. And, uh, yeah, last week uh, I got her story a bit mixed up with one of the other nuns called Kisargatami. And Kisargatami was the nun who went from house to house looking for mustard seeds after her son died. The Buddha said, if you can find any house... um, bring the mustard seed back from any house where somebody hasn't died. So she went looking for these mustard seeds from house to house and of course realised that there is no house where no one dies. But Patachara, the uh, enlightened nun in the Buddha's day, is the one who I have the statue of, or who we, a statue of her is coming to me, made in Bali, and it's a very, very beautiful Um, wood carving of this um, great enlightened nun who was a real person, you know, so it's not a mythical it's a fine if you like mythical figures too, you know, or deities but I always relate more to people who lived, historical figures who I know something about and Patachara was the one who lost her entire family, she actually lost both sons her husband and her parents all in the same day in a series of catastrophic events related to a storm 
and uh, and I'm getting this beautiful statue of her, and it's just got the deepest serenity about it, the deepest sense of calm, as though she really has experienced everything life can throw at you, and has risen above that with this incredible, serene, equanimous wisdom. But her story was interesting because when she came in contact with the Buddha, he taught her the path and she had her struggles like we all do, you know. She was thinking to herself, why, when I'm doing everything right, I'm following the instructions, I'm living a virtuous life, why aren't I seeing the Dhamma? Why aren't I attaining to these super mundane states? But then the story went that after, you know, this kind of maybe lack of uh, confidence at that moment that we all go through, no matter how long we've been practicing. Um, she was just relaxing and washing her feet. And she was pouring the water from a jog down onto her feet and she noticed how the water was just flowing and how the water that was flowing was, you know, in a constant flux, that it was not the same water that fell down and was continuing down the hill. So she saw this kind of river of life. And I think that was an analogy, really, for seeing that the mind and the body are in a constant flow. You know, the mind and the body are constantly changing. Nothing stays the same. It's like a river of consciousness, a river of, you know, uh, cells and, and blood and whatever makes up this body. Everything's constantly changing. You know, all the cells in the body are said to be replaced every seven years. And not all of a sudden, you know, on day one of the seventh year, but <laughs> but this is happening all the time. And we can start to feel this in meditation. We can start to sense that things are changing. And not only within the half hour, but things are changing actually within a second or a millisecond when the mindfulness is really sharp. And so it's when the mind has this energy and this stillness that can overcome the hindrances that we have a chance to see the deeper truths of how things are and, um, and develop the kind of wisdom that frees, yeah. the wisdom into things like impermanence, like non-self, that nothing belongs to me. How can this body and mind belong to me if it's changing all the time? I can't control how it changes or when. I can't, you know, predict when my last moment is about to come. For some people it's a slow decline, for others it could be an accident or, you know, a disease that's there that you don't even know about. We don't know because we don't own this body. If anything, nature owns this body and mind. So when we see these things, it's very freeing and even seeing them little bit by little, you know, we realise it doesn't make much sense to cling. It doesn't make much sense to try to own or control our experience or the experience of anybody else, right? And in that softening of the grip, in that loosening, our uh, holding on, our picking up, there's already a sense of freedom and spaciousness, a sense of energy in the mind. The mind becomes depressed and tight and contracted when we try and cling on to things, when we don't want things to change, you know. I think that's another cause, isn't it, for depression and for just this sense of things closing in. You know, we exhaust ourselves trying to put our energy into things we can't control, trying to control what we can't control, instead of learning to receive life in its flow, in its flux. So, I've said a lot there, um, but I'll quickly recap. So we talked about confidence and how that can be a proximate cause for energy to arise in the mind through inspiration, yeah, through uh, freeing ourselves from doubt, from crippling doubt, through providing a resting place for the mind. And then we talked about um, how in daily life we can... Uh, rouse energy in the mind through inspiration in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, or through inspiration in kindness, inspiration um, in anything that moves the heart. And also, ah, I didn't say, in nature as well. Nature is a very energising um, thing for the mind, much more so than, you know, Netflix or Facebook. <laughs> Spend some time with the trees. And then also in... Um, 
in ch- attuning to our needs, into what we need right now. How can I best care for this moment, for this body, heart, and mind right now? You know, this can bring energy. And often what we need is rest. And then we talked as well about meditation and how in meditation the best way to energize the mind, in fact, the time that the mind does grow in energy is when we keep it still. And we just gently learn to incline the mind more and more towards knowing rather than trying to make meditation happen. And again, this is possible when we deepen our trust, we deepen our confidence in the teachings. We put our trust, we put our confidence in the process and not in the results. Yeah? So we make the process the important part. And that's what Ajahn Brown meant when he said to me, your goal is contentment, not jhanas or enlightenment. Yeah? So we look at how we're relating to our mind, what we're putting in there, and then we can be confident that the results will be beautiful, will be liberating, will be beneficial for ourselves and other beings, whoever we encounter. So, that's more than enough for me. And 